Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part there of the 10th of January 2023. 2024, get the right year. Uh, sorry, a little bit behind today. Um, life gets in the way. So we'll go to where we usually start. U Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats supply. You can find them in the description to the video found below. 800 personnel loss, very similar to yesterday. Come high number relative to what we've experienced in in the wars up to really the last three months uh, but actually 800 now is 500 below or 580 below the largest number that's been posted in the last three months so 800 used to be a high figure now it's not so high but really it is that's a lot of troops to lose in a day uh, off the battlefield uh, two tanks 13 armoured personnel vehicles and 12 artillery systems. Uh, fairly low on the tank, well, very low on the tank uh, tank category there. 13 APVs is, yeah, it's not going to be great losing 13 APVs in a day, but again, that's lower than what we, we've been used to, and the same with 12 artillery systems, but still useful numbers. Uh, two multiple launch rocket systems, one anti-aircraft warfare system, 23 vehicles and fuel tanks, uh, fairly high. Well, I guess you would say that's middle of the range actually these days. Uh, and three pieces of special equipment. So not not the highest day of figures, but then there will be some tough conditions in terms of weather to deal with for both sides. Right, this is the list of losses that Andrew Perpetua has compiled looking at the socials for the last 24 hours. As I've said before, skews towards drone losses. Uh, and we can see that it is not quite parity, sort of approaching two to one Russian to Ukrainian losses. Let's look at the value of those losses. Artillery, a number of M109s actually, and M777 there. So some Western provided artillery being lost there. Not the end of the world, but still four pieces is... Yeah, a bit of a bit of an issue a t64 and some vehicles and a decoy actually so you can take really the decoy off the ukrainian so it probably is a good two to one ratio and we go and look at the russian losses quite a few bits of electronic warfare equipment this is going to be super important if ukraine want to degrade the russian electronic warfare capabilities of course to try and uh, reach parity it depends where this is it's very difficult to extrapolate localized advantages for either side across the whole of the front line so for example in the Krinky area the ukrainians have a counter battery advantage they have an artillery advantage i think and they have an electronic warfare and drone advantage but i wouldn't extrapolate that uh, further out from the sort of very localized Krinky area right across the front line because i think in many other places the russians have electronic warfare advantage and drone advantage so it's, it's difficult to to make any sweeping generalizations but it's going to be super useful useful to for the ukrainians to take out four bits of electronic warfare and two surveillance and comms bits of equipment another recovery vehicle taken out these brem l's are now starting to be lost uh, a number of times two toss 1a uh, we'll talk about toss 1a's in a uh, in a second that is a bit of a sore loss for the russians that's like six million dollar piece of kit six and a half million dollar piece of kit two of those to be lost in a day and they've lost a lot of those recently um uh, some more artillery pieces another t90m tank so that's their top tank the t90 breakthrough tank the most recent uh, and expensive tank other than the t14 armata that's not really well not isn't used at all on the front line uh, and then some infantry fighting vehicles artillery uh, sorry civilian pieces of kit and uh, whatnot so yeah, I think this is a high value section for the Russians, not least because they have more equipment being lost, but also because some of those pieces of equipment might well be um, expensive. I don't know about the EW when it just says EW without looking at the video stuff and and knowing more about the, those instances. It's difficult to say what the value is, but I imagine that's probably fairly high value equipment. Um Okay, moving on. So this is to talk about the TOS 1A. You've got another uh, bit of footage of a TOS 1A. Uh, it might be the same one from the other day, but anyway, two more have been lost since then. 
as according to Andrew Perpetua. So the, the point is still relevant. The war in Ukraine exposed many Russian weapons as absolute failures, says Tender. The TOS 1A is one at the top of, uh, is at one of the top positions of this questionable honor. Low firing range, so it can only fire about six kilometers, and slow loading time combined with easily inflammable ammunition make it an ideal target for cheap commercial FPV drones. The fact that the launcher alone costs $6 million paraphrases the absolute atrocious cost-benefit ratio. Perun did a really good video on game-changing pieces of kit. And in that, he looks at the cost of each piece of kit, the amount of damage they've done, uh, how much they're being used, etc., etc., etc. Does a kind of evaluation of what is the most game-changing bit of equipment. And he included the, the TOS-1 thermovaric launches on that list but concluded it wasn't a game changer because of this ratio i'd like him to do actually the other end of the spectrum which is instead of the game changers the, the most disappointing weapons piece of kit to have been brought to the front line for both sides uh, and see if this is up there as well because it's a pretty horrific weapon when it does work it is horrendous but it's fairly expensive and it is very vulnerable for the above mentioned reasons. So, you know, they produce absolutely spectacular explosions when they're hit and they do do some horrific damage, but uh, I don't know that they have been that effective really on the, in this war. Okay, a couple, and they are starting to be lost at, at fairly significant levels. A couple of days ago, Russian media reported that an explosive device was detonated on a railway in uh, Nizhny Tagil. Now a video from locals has appeared online showing the damage caused. This is 1,650 kilometers from the front line. So this is partisan activity, uh, some explosives laid on a railway track, uh, and this is the video from it. There are some problems. Lots of people are complaining about videos loading on Twitter at the moment. So if you can't see the videos, it, it, it's not necessarily my fault. This is that same video, I believe, anyway. So there were apparently nine destroyed railroad fuel tanks. I don't know what damage, if any, was done to the track itself. Nonetheless, this has uh, caused some consternation for the Russians. And these are the sorts of strikes that, that are really useful for the ukrainians obviously so that's a long way from ukraine too shows that the reach that ukraine has into russia nowhere you could argue is safe uh Tim White saying Russia on fire. So earlier he wrote about Penza being one of the places where many are without power or hot water. We're going to return to that again today. Around 2,500 are affected there. If they stand around the nearby construction site, though, they may at least keep warm as a large fire has enveloped the site. Two people died there. So there are. I think we're seeing a spike in Russia on fire instances again. Uh, here's another one. A garment factory burned down in Vladimir region of Russia. This was a scene at the Finnish Good Warehouse in the village of Mur Murumtsevo. No injuries, all the hallmarks of an insurance job. So insurance is probably a result of, or insurance jobs are probably a result of the war because the economy is tanking, people aren't selling, rather than, you know, close down and mothball a, a shopping mall or, you know, garment factory going out of business, have it burned down and claim off insurance. Uh, jobs are good and so that's what you're seeing rather a lot of one might surmise given all these for incident incidents of fire right moving on to distant strikes so standoff munitions uh, quite a bit to report but really all from the ukrainian point of view uh, i i don't know that there's any uh, strikes on ukraine from the russians and there might have been a couple of of dis long distance drones um anyway uh, an oil depot in oriol has been hit by an attack, attack drone according to telegram channels in russia this was doing the rounds a lot yesterday because this is fairly deep into russia as well they are uh, and will will uh, continue on that theme in a second they are hitting within russia i think quite a bit at the moment fuel tank was hit at the oriol naf uh, nafto product plant but they claim no further fires broke out and of course no injuries uh, so that is um significant because the ukrainians are using their distance drones to affect at the moment the drone attack in the oriol region is a gur operation apparently um so there you go um as someone says if a single drone attack in Zelensky's ukraine is a whole gur operation it tells you a lot about the mighty mouse might soon firing hurts in the morning will be a gur operation so this is a bit a bit of naysaying but the point is that they are able to 
strike individually or with two or three there was there were actually claims of three drones i think one was taken down maybe but two drones i think hit in the oriel region which is quite close it's on the way to moscow if ukraine are scaling up then if three drones can become 20 or 30 drones a few months down the line and this becomes a, a much more significant problem for for russia and i think it will get to that stage because as we'll hear in my next video the ukrainians are apparently producing more drones than they can afford that the state can can buy so which then allows people to speculate that well actually you know foreign agencies can come in and help out loads there say okay we can't produce you know the british for example might say well we've got nothing in our warehouses but if you've literally built a bunch of drones that your own government can't afford to buy then here's two billion quid help yourselves guys and and you know outside nations other nations can really help ukraine with drones and then if that translates to many of these being drones that, that are able to be fired into russia you can see really important strategic targets being taken out especially since there is a lot of claim and the british intelligence update talked about this yesterday about how air defenses have been seriously degraded the russian air defense have been seriously degraded okay albeit mainly down in crimea but what will possibly happen is as air defenses get hammered in crimea you might bring air defenses from inside russia nearer to the front line and that leaves gaps within russia which allows the gur and other you know uh, entities to you know the ukrainians to hit targets within russia um things are looking interesting on occupied crimea again this photo was taken in yet Pretoria in the last hour actually when i say the last hour this was uh this was last night um but yeah or yesterday uh, obviously in the daytime um so crimea has was been targeted in the last 24 hours kursk as well so going into russia again russia says three drones were shot down in kursk uh, they think all three were aiming at the city's airport obviously the usual no damage no casualties is stated but that's clearly not reliable says tim white um and yeah it's a drone update on russia this was yesterday that uh, as i said there were three hits on oriel um i'm not sure that all three i th three here i think one was uh yeah one of the three drones was supposedly shot down yeah um and then two drones attacked the russian military airfield in engels 2 this is something that has happened previously and they have lost some some bombers there this is in the saratov region uh, again really uh significant that the ukrainians are now ramping up their strikes deep within russia and this now, this is the kind of strike that the pro-Ukrainians will really be paying paying close attention to, because what's hurting the Ukrainians most at the moment are the cruise missiles and the ballistic missiles sent by uh, Russia from in Russia, and it's places like the Engels Air Base that are sending them or the Black Sea Fleet. So the Ukrainians have done a really good job in constraining the Black Sea Fleet, and you would expect hits on Novorossiysk to keep the Black Sea Fleet at bay or uh, or keep degrading the fleet. Here is is the idea of they need to degrade the russian strike capabilities from from the air uh and engels air base is target pretty much target number one astra writes there were two drones so only two drones uh they were shot down and fell onto the territory of the airfield the consequences are still unknown whether that's true or not i i don't know the russians always say that they shoot down 100 percent of what is fired at, at russia but uh, it's not often true but when there are only two drones you'd imagine engels airfield is going to have pretty decent air defenses However, previously the Ukrainians have successfully struck there and, and they probably got greater capabilities now. So uh, watch this space, as in watch the airspace in Russia over the next month or two. I think you will start seeing many more strikes within Russia uh, and that includes down in Novorossiysk as well, as mentioned previously. And apparently right now, to uh, temporarily occupied Berdyansk, that's on the, uh, on the coast of the Azov Sea, occupied Zaporizhia, or is it Donetsk? Uh, Zaporizhia, I think. Uh, in the temporarily occupied Berdyansk anyway, sounds of explosions are heard. Uh, we are waiting for official confirmation. Uh, so lots of stuff going on, but almost entirely from the Ukrainians. And then what does that tell us? So like I said before, if the Russians aren't hitting on consecutive nights, then it's because they can't hit on uh, consecutive nights. Otherwise, they would. If, they, if Russia had a million missiles, they would just be sending them off every night. Yep, another 50. Yep, another 50. Yep, another 50. That they can't 
or sorry, that they aren't means that they can't. It means they're stockpiling. It means they're working at production levels. They don't have the stockpiles that they had at the beginning of the war. I mean, to me, this is obvious. The amount of missiles they sent, thousands of missiles, over the course of the whole war, they're not going to have the stockpiles that they had at the beginning of the war. So what we're seeing is they're firing a bunch and then having to produce them, procure them, transport them, uh, and get them ready. So, and and there's that there's that delay. And it's the same for the the Ukrainians, but you know it's when you hear the pro pro Kremlin voices just spouting nonsense about how capable the Russians are. They have run low on missiles. Otherwise, you would be seeing them. There's no reason that Russia would just hold on to missiles for a laugh. Yeah, we've got a couple of hundred missiles that we could fire tonight, but you know, it'll take a night off. It's not going to happen. Uh, okay, moving on to other bits and pieces. Anton Gerishchenko talking again for like the fourth day in a row about massive outages of hot water, heat and electricity uh, happening across, as he says, Russia, according to Russian media. So following the residents in the Moscow region who continue to complain on mass about lack of heating, Russians are freezing in the Tver region, so another region. Residents of a house in the village of uh, Novodzat, Zavidovsky say they are being killed by the cold. It's freezing outside and the temperature in their apartments is around 4 degrees. So that's add, water starts to freeze at 4 degrees. The locals have be, already appealed to all possible authorities, but no one has helped them. Quote, there are no hostilities, but we live like in besieged Leningrad, locals complain. On the 9th, heating also disappeared in residential buildings in Saratov, Kanti Manisk district, uh, Vladimir, Penza, and several cities near Moscow, uh, Solnechu, Nechnogorsk, Kuznetsk, and, and numerous cottage communities. So this is becoming more and more widespread. Why am I reporting on this? A, because it's it's newsworthy, uh, and B, it's newsworthy worthy because if you start getting discontent with other things outside of the war, but arguably connected to the war, in other words, yeah, they aren't spending money on sorting out heating. Why? Because they're spending money on the war. If you, if you start seeing widespread discontent, then this could spill over into, into being discontent about the war. Now, the polls suggest that that's broadly not the case at the moment, but can you trust the Russian polls? What do people really think on the ground? I don't know. But this is going to help the Ukrainian cause. Everything that goes bad in Russia can be, albeit tenuously, linked to the war, right? So it, though pro-Ukrainians kind of... It, it, it is a bit um uh, it's a bit like delighting in other people's misery uh but you know sort of schadenfreude but it you know russia doing badly across the board is good for ukraine because you want the regime to struggle you want people to get angry with not only local authorities but eventually that to 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 move upwards to uh, Putin. Unfortunately, Putin seems to be immune from criticism as people only ever blame the middlemen and the politicians below Putin. No one ever blames Putin himself because he has that divine status and uh, I guess people are too afraid to do so. This is all, this is all useful for Ukraine. What I'm trying to say, I know I'm scouring news from Russia more closely, says Tim White, but I don't think I've ever seen as many complaints about the loss of heating among residents and the lack of help from local council. Today, protesters in Belozhsky, uh, Dmitrov, Elektrostal, Podolsk and Penza are freezing. So there's a couple more places on top of what Gerashchenko was saying. This is significant, right? Okay, hackers of the Blackjack Group broke the Moscow internet provider M9Com and demolished its servers. Quote, we are talking about 20 terabytes of deleted data. As a result, some Moscow residents are left without internet and TV. The Ukrainian hackers are really active at the moment. However, they are also repelling some Russian attacks. The Russians are trying, I think, possibly in response to the Ukrainian attacks. There's been a real uptick in Ukrainian um, cyber attacks on Russia. So... I think they're fighting back and Ukraine are 
it, you know, repelling on a daily basis some pretty major attacks on the Russians, but the Ukrainians are having some some pretty decent success at the moment. Uh, DTEK power restored to 218,000 people in Odessa, Dnipro Petrovsk Oblast. So Ukrainians themselves are obviously suffering from uh, energy issues due to both, as it says here, swathes of the country without power due to winter weather and Russians' attacks on energy infrastructure. So there are still these issues but the difference being the the ukrainians bend over backwards to get those issues sorted out asap whereas those issues appear to be ongoing in russia as their attentions are switched elsewhere a defense minister umarov commander in chief uh, and sorry and commander in chief solution and chief of the general staff shaptala visited the positions of the ukrainian forces in the kupiansk region um alexander sirsky uh a commander of the Kortitsia grouping familiarized himself with the situation around Kupiansk, where Ukrainian soldiers repel constant attempts of the enemy to attack. So there's lots of worries about Kupiansk being a place to attack. Uh, I had the honor to meet with the commander of the units that were fighting in, a direct, in this direction now, reporting on the situation, current challenges, decisions will be made in the future near future the enemy will not like it said umarov so lots of bullish co uh, talk and rhetoric there lots of high level people meeting concerning kupiansk there's also been a meeting yesterday i thought i had it i don't have it there was a meeting yesterday i think between zelensky zeluzhny basically all the all the top dogs and umarov with regards to i might have it in my military aid section actually i think it is with regard to um what ukraine need uh, and so, yeah, as you would imagine, there are going to be those meetings all the time, right? Right, uh, moving on to other things. BBC, BBC's Russian service reported on the 8th that Russian authorities have detained thousands of Ukrainian civilians in penal colonies and pre-trial detention centres in Russia and occupied Ukraine for opposing the special military operation. Uh, that's, that's lots of Ukrainians in those occupied territories saying, no, we're not up for that. Sometimes even being called for... Uh, mobilization themselves um, and in protesting that they are locked up in, in penal colonies and same with those back in Russia I presume people who have gone through filtration camps but also many people in Russia who will be of Ukrainian descent as well or have strong connections to Ukraine um, Alexei Navalny the opposition leader who's been locked up and is looking like he's going to be locked up for the next 30 years is uh, being shown for the first time via video link so he kind of went missing then popped up three weeks later in a prison somewhere else uh the Kovrov city court held a hearing on the politician's lawsuit for illegal placement in solitary confinement cell, cell the even though russia has rules on how long you can be in solitary confinement they appear to break it routinely especially with pow's not sure the situation with navalny but he is certainly um well he's he's looking well all things considered minus the beard that he supposedly had before but yeah good to see him alive uh there were there were those worries that he had been disappeared and then finally to leave you on a positive note uh, here's a 10 year old search and rescue dog so pretty uh gray around the chops there but uh still enjoying life 10 year old search and re rescue dog sparky continues saving lives in ukraine the belgian malinois has rescued over 140 people from rubble using her expert nose and agility to find survivors at age 10 she shows no signs of slowing down still scrambling into tight spots and giving hope when this war ends, there will be so many stories of heroic activities and behaviour, heroism from humans and one presumes animals alike. Uh, so many rescues taking place, so many um, incredible feats of courage and bravery that are no doubt happening on a daily basis, both on the front lines and very far from the front lines. Uh, I think... Um, yeah, it'll, it'll be heartwarming to see some of those stories and yet heartbreaking to read of so many others as well as uh, as information comes to light of what has taken place in this war. Anyway, thank you for watching. Please take care, uh, like, subscribe and share if you could. That would be amazing. And I'll speak to you relatively soon.